So the basis of this talk is sort of turning personal work into a paid work and assignment work. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus heavily on a one specific project and walk you through the various steps of that project that sort of opened up um, my career path and led to where I am today. And I'll, th I'll, I'll talk about um, some other projects along the way. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, this is the kind of work that I'm like doing right now. This is just a, uh, I think this is like the homepage of my website is just sort of a, a gallery of images. Um, a little backstory is that I started off, uh, I grew up in Boston. Um, I started off in high school doing black and white darkroom photography throughout high school and college. Um, my mom is Brazilian, so I studied abroad in Brazil in college and moved to Sao Paulo uh, for five years after college. And it was there that I started my career as a photographer. I uh, ended up getting a job working for the top photographer in Sao Paulo as like the lowliest studio person who had to come in at 5 AM and like paint the walls. But it was really an eye-opening experience into what it's like to be a working professional photographer. Um, so in 2007, I moved to New York. And uh, ever since, I've just been here hustling as a freelancer, um, trying to get by and make my living as a photographer. Uh, in the beginning, when I first got here, I shot um, lots of events and weddings, and I assisted you know, anything that I could do to get by. Um, but I was always shooting work for myself, personal stuff um, throughout it all, you know, never giving up on that. Um, and this is just a sampling of some recent uh, work that was published. I'm mostly, I now consider myself um, a commercial and editorial photographer who's always working on personal projects. I'd say definitely more editorial um, than commercial these days. Um, so I'm just going to back up and start from the beginning to show you sort of how I got um, to this slide here. Um, it all begins on a small farm on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Um, it's about uh, an hour and a half uh, from Boston, for those of you who don't know Martha's Vineyard. Um, and it's where I grew up spending my summers. Um, and I kind of have this guy to thank for getting my career off the ground. Uh, this is Chris Fisher. He is uh, a 12th generation islander, um, so his family has been on the island forever. Uh, he's a chef and a farmer. Um, and I know him uh, from summers growing up since I was like six years old, maybe. We would be friendly, you know, say hi to each other, but never really friends. Um, and when I moved home from Brazil in 2007, uh, I was out on the vineyard for a summer and kind of reconnected with him and um, just started hanging out with him and shooting the kind of stuff that he was doing. Um, before that, I considered myself a portrait photographer. Like, uh, I love people and the inter interaction with people and the relationships that you form when you're shooting with people. And the idea of shooting food to me felt like um, just something I was not interested in at all, like being in a studio with like lighting and fake tools, and that didn't interest me at all. But watching Chris um, with his farming and food stuff, I just sort of hung out and would shoot um, everything that he was doing. So he was farming. Um, this is on his family's farm that uh, he took over um, a couple, of, or I guess at this point it was like seven years ago. Um, just, you know, anything that he was doing, I would just hang out and shoot. Um, and he had uh, people working for him. Luckily for me, everyone working for him was really good looking. Um, so <laughs> that helped a lot with my photos. Um, so farming and slaughtering was something that um, I had never been a part of or witnessed before. And hanging out with him, I started watching him um, do some slaughtering. So sorry, warning, these pictures are not too graphic. But, um, and I, you know, I had never witnessed it before. And just watching him sort of kill an animal for the first time is he has this whole method. And um, it's kind of almost like spiritual to watch him do it. Uh, and, he, and he's been doing this you know, from as a kid with his father. And it just comes naturally to him. But I was just fascinated. And, and for people who are meat eaters, I think it's really important to sort of watch this process. So in addition to farming and slaughtering, he was also cooking. Um, he grew up on the island, but left for culinary school uh, in New York, and then ended up working for Mario Batali and Alice Waters. He worked at the River Cafe in London. So he's sort of making the rounds. But he came back um, to the island in 2006 or 2007, um, around the same time I did, wanting to really set up his roots on the island where his family was and sort of establish something there. Uh, some cooking shots here. And um, 
so 2007 I'm shooting him. In 2008, he started doing um, what he called greenhouse dinners. So this is on his farm in the actual greenhouse where he was growing things. He just set up very impromptu, like these tables and bales of hay to sit on. And um, the first one ever was actually he just invited the farm hands, to people who are hanging out on the farm, to come have lunch in the greenhouse. And I was part of there for that and happened to shoot it. Um, and then he was like, oh, this is kind of cool, like, you know, serving food in the farm with his food background and, you know, pulling up the vegetables right from the dirt there and putting them on the t table. So he started doing more and more of these greenhouse dinners. And um, I would just be along with him and uh, he'd tell me when he's doing them and I'd be like, okay, I'll be there like, you know, five hours before it started so I could shoot the whole process of setting up and getting ready and, and then the actual event. This is a different one. Um, and then he actually did some cool things like this was, uh, I think, a little dinner beforehand, but then had a, a concert inside the greenhouse. So it just kind of became this community space almost. And his, just his approach to everything was, was unlike anything I had seen. Um, so a couple summers later, after shooting him for a while, I had some, you know, a chunk of images, and I thought it was pretty cool, and he was like into me shooting with him. And so we decided to do this pop-up exhibit on the farm, just like one night, um, like printed out quickly all the images that I had been shooting with him. And uh, this was 2011, so we had this pop-up um, here. It was just, you know, super casual, like at the actual farm stand, wherever there was like a surface, would hang up photos, um, you know, where the uh, vegetable fruit usually sold, would put some photos. The, um, the prints, um, we actually went to like a local thrift shop and bought like all this really, really bad art that had really nice frames. So we bought and like for super cheap, like ripped, took out the art and then Chris helped like retrofit everything. So it was like a mishmash of different frames that we found and framed some of the work. And um, very casual, we invited like friends around and this was cool. I, I like printed about 300 four by six cards and just had them spread out on the table and anyone who wanted to could just take however many they wanted and bring it home. And throughout the summer, I would like see my images on people's fridge, so that was kind of cool. And uh, he made uh, food for the event, of course. It was these delicious tomato and mayo sandwiches on a baguette. Um, so that was just really fun. And I, I sold like a couple prints that, like, that were there that I now see also in people's homes, which is cool. Um, so I, I had this body of work um, with Chris. Um, I wasn't sure yet what I was doing or what I wanted to do with it, but um, I basically, you know, at this point had over a thousand images maybe and decided I wanted to put something together as sort of concrete to show what I've been doing. Um, so I made a PDF. This is the actual cover of the PDF. Um, and there was about 30 images I chose. Uh, and I just sent it around to family and friends, not trying to get work or trying to market myself, but just like, hey guys, like this is what I've been up to with Chris over the past couple summers. Um, this is just a sampling of some of the images that were in the PDF. It was very simple, like that was the cover. I'm not like a designer in any way, and you know, it was just like you know, each page was one photo. There was no text or anything over it. Um, so, sent it to friends, and a friend sent it to a friend, who sent it to a friend, and flash forward, I'm in California uh, in the fall, and I had just arrived there for a conference. I was going to be there for the week, and my phone rings, an unidentified number. Um, and at this point, um, I had been in New York also, not in the summers, but um, in, during the year, kind of, as I said, assisting and um, shooting events, but also shooting some small editorial jobs. I had shot a little bit for Time Out, for like the Metro newspaper, just kind of like small things, nothing like a major publication. So I'm in California, my cell phone rings, and it's a woman, and she says, um, Hi, this is Jen Miller. I'm the photo director of Martha Stewart Magazine. I never do this, but we just came across your PDF of the Beelbung Farm images, and we have this assignment coming up in Maine and think that um, your work might be like perfect um, for it. Are, are you interested in shooting this assignment in Maine? So, of course, I was like, oh my god, yes! Like, you know, I didn't hesitate. I was, you know, in California. I didn't have any equipment with me other than my camera. Uh, maybe two lenses, it might have been just one lens, like no tripod, no lights or anything. Um, and you know, I knew that this was like a chance for me. I couldn't turn it down. I got on a red eye that night, flew to Maine, um, which I think that they were, Martha Stewart was impressed that like I would like cancel my plans and do that. So that was like bonus points for me. <laughs> and then um, I ended up at this apple orchard in Maine. 
um, for three days shooting a story about um, this guy. His name is John Bunker. He's the top pomologist in the country, which a pomologist is uh, someone who studies apples and apple species. And um, you'll see like in these images that it has a sort of similar vibe to Be the Long Farm uh, in that it's sort of, it was a small family operated farm and, <coughs> sorry, um, and, and that I was able to just sort of hang out on the farm and shoot uh, what they were doing. It's very rare now to have sort of three days like that to like dive in on the sort of editorial assignments. So I feel very fortunate about that and I'm very happy with the images that I created here. Um, and they didn't really give me a, a really a dense shot list. It was a pretty small shot list. So that just like, you know, not very specific things I needed to capture, but just what caught my eye. You know, so I was able to shoot something like this, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and just walk around and shoot everything and really spend time with people. I was there, you know, for, got up at sunrise every day to sunset um, and just shot everything. This was really cool. So he. Everyone in town knows that he's this pomologist. So um, people will come to his house with apples that they found like on their property or something and, um, and give him the apple. He'll taste it and then he'll like tell them the origin of like where their tree came from and what the species is. And um, he, he was talking about this and like as he was telling us about it that day, like someone pick, pulled up in a pickup truck like with a thing of apples and be like, what are these? Um, and that night, like spent the night there and we did like a, apple pie eating, con not contest, but like, like, like they, he, his wife baked like all these apple pies and like we all had to like try them and like, describe them and talk about them and it was fun. <laughs> um, so I think this story really established my style as it's known today, which is using lots of natural light, um, not very overly produced and shooting a mix of landscapes and food and people and just, you know, anything that catches my eye. Um, this is what actually ran. Um, so this was 10 page story. You know, it wasn't just like one image in the front of the book. This was like a full on feature in a national magazine. So for me, it was the first time. So it was very exciting. And still to this day, it's one of my favorite stories that ran in print. And if you think back to sort of the images in the PDF and the early Beetlebunk photos, you can see how looking at those images would translate it into a, an assignment like this. Um, so the story was published. It was a success. You know, the people of Martha Stewart loved it. I loved it. And I was kind of hooked. I was getting paid to do uh, what I love in the style that I love. Um, but at that point, I hadn't met anyone at the magazine. And uh, I'll talk about it again and again. Like, it's all about personal relationships. Um, so after the story ran that fall, I came into the office to meet with um, the photo editors. And <coughs> um, they had seen the Beetlebunk PDF. Um, I didn't have a portfolio book at the time, at least not something that was, you know, appropriate for Martha Stewart. Um, so I actually made a box of the work, which I brought for you. I found it like under my bed. Um, so this is like I found this like tin box at a flea market, and I kind of retrofitted it inside. I found this like picnicy cloth fabric to get with the farm vibe, and I printed out um, 50 images um, from like the Beetlebung stuff just at home on my printer. And I brought this to show them. And anyone who wants to can look through it after. Um, and they, uh, you know, they had already seen the work, but seeing the image presented like that, the people in the magazine were like, oh, these are really good. Like, we should run this in the magazine. And so um, they ended up to picking it up um, to run uh, in a story that summer, um, which was great for me, another like feature story, um, and great for Chris to get you know, PR for him and his cooking. So this is what ran. And I love that it's just really about the photographs. I love like just like a clean, simple design. And you know, they had the recipes later on in the magazine, but this part was just sort of the photos. Um, and that sort of really established my relationship working with Martha Stewart, which I, I work for a lot now. Um, so after that came out with Chris, I s continued still shooting with him every summer. Um, here's just some random images that we made. And you know he continued doing all sorts of events, so I would shoot those. This was uh, another cool thing he did was like a movie night on the farm. But had a big screen um, brought out on the farm and bales of hay. And I forget which movie was uh, presented, but it was just a fun night. Uh, 
And he would start also doing events in the greenhouse, but they would get so much interest, he would do them, uh, you know, out, have people outside of the greenhouse as well. So uh, in parallel, like sort of my career was a little bit starting off from that, and his career was taking off. We were getting lots of press since the Martha Stewart story came out. Um, this is a side note, the guy sitting uh, on the right here in this image is actually Adam Platt, who's uh, the top food critic for New York Magazine. So he had come to the farm um, to try Chris's cooking. Um, so Chris was doing all sorts of things. This was a pop-up restaurant that he ended up doing in New York City on the Lower East Side for a few weeks, um, December about three years ago, maybe. Um, then the images started getting pick, picked up by other publications. This is a magazine in China that ran a story uh, with the images. Um, there's a couple blogs, the Kinfolk magazine, um, and a feature shoot, which is a, a great photography blog. Um, that uh, ran a little piece about the images. And then what happened was I started getting a couple assignments um, from other publications to shoot uh, with Chris, whereas not, not just picking up images that I already had, but I was getting hired and paid by new clients to shoot exactly what I had been doing already on my own with Chris. So this was a story for French Glamour. Um, they sent a writer out to the island, and uh, she hung out for the week. And again, I just hung out and shot everything, and sort of this is what ran. And that, that was kind of the first time it was, not the first time, but uh, it was just like reaffirming and just like made me so happy that I was getting paid to shoot what I was already doing on my own. So, you know, personal work, real work, all combining. Uh, so I really count the Avil story and then the subsequent publishing of the Beetlebung story um, in Martha Stewart as when I sort of broke out in terms of getting editorial work and the start of my sort of career in New York. Uh, this was just sort of, a, like an email promo that I put together to send out to people. It's just a, a simple like JPEG that I attached at the bottom of the emails um, and would email photo editors to wanting to introduce myself uh, to them in my work. You know, and uh, I would you know, go to uh, mag uh, bookstores and newsstands and just find any magazine that I wanted to shoot for, see who the photo editor was, try to see if I could find their email somehow of lots of creative Googling. And would just write them and say, you know, I love your publication. You know, I wouldn't do like a blank copy and paste and send out to 20 people because they know that that, you know, that's not that's not a good way to do it. So, you know, send an individual email to the photo editor, say, you know, I love your publication, especially, you know, X, Y, and Z story that ran last month. You know, show that you actually know the publication and are familiar with what they do. Um, and I'd love to work together with you sometime. Here's a sample of my work. Here's a link to my website. And uh, so that, that was the first time that I kind of did that with, with the, this image, these images from Beetlebung. So all of a sudden, then I started um, working, getting more work. Um, I was getting the work I wanted to be shooting. Um, I wasn't working all the time, but you know, not steady, but you know, slowly picking up. Um, oh, say I was getting the work that I wanted to be shooting, which was Hot Farmers. <laughs> I literally, probably, after the, the Beetlebung story came out, maybe five or six assignments that was that was like, you know, kind of similar farm thing and, and you know, shooting hot farmers. <laughs> um, this was actually a story in the south of France about um, um, scent, uh, smell and perfume and ties to memory. So it was the flower farmers um, in Grasse in the south of France. Um, this was a story from Monocle. I forget why he was important, but a farmer in upstate New York. And uh, this is a, a, far, a farmer, a family in uh, Seattle. Uh, that I, I shot this for Martha Stewart. Um, they, she's a farmer florist, which means she uh, not only grows her own flowers, but then also does all the arrangements for them. Um, so this is for Martha Stewart. As I said, I, shot, I shoot a lot for Martha Stewart. They're definitely my top client now. Probably done maybe like 20, 25 features for them at this point. Um, so I just brought a couple uh, other stories for them so you could see some of the other work. Um, this was in Virginia. This is a woman, um, it's called Blue Sky Farm. She grows lavender and then makes lavender soap and um, lavender brittle. This is a, a story of a couple in Washington who um, they transport rare plant species from Asia and uh, cultivate them uh, and then sell them. This is a herb garden in Nova Scotia. And uh, so uh, th this is, she sells uh, these herb jams and jellies. That's what those jars are. 
sorry. Um, this is an indigo um, grower and textile designer in Indiana. This is actually, just shot this in the fall. It hasn't come out yet. It'll probably come out um, next fall, maybe. So Martha shoots a lot of the stuff a year ahead of time because a lot of it is sort of seasonally based. Um, not all, a lot of magazines, the way that, because I, I do a lot of farming and food, food flower stuff, that, that that's the case. But some of them are obviously sooner than a, a year's time. Um, you know, not, and then I, you know, I was obviously not only shooting for Martha Stewart. So, you know, having published work leads to more published work. It's just sort of how it goes. Um, this is a story I shot for Town and Country. Um, I started shooting a lot for Connie Nast Traveler. Um, I, I think it definitely was a good fit for me. Like, you know, I travel a ton. I've lived abroad a lot. I speak a lot of languages. Um, but also, as I said, it's all about personal relationships. One of the photo editors from Martha Stewart, who I had a great relationship with, left to go to Condé Nast Traveler. So she knew me, knew my work. We had a great relationship. And now she's at a new magazine. So then all of a sudden, I start working all the time for Condé Nast Traveler. And like Martha, Condé Nast Traveler has been like such a great fit for me. Here's some uh, other stories I shot for them. This is a story in West Texas. This is a story in Maine. Um, I actually just got back um, last week from uh, two weeks shooting in Oman in the Middle East, um, which I didn't really even know where it was when I got the assignment and had to Google it. And it was amazing. I tell want everyone to go there. It was really cool. Um, so I shoot a lot for the Travel Channel as well. This was a really fun assignment um, at Sturgis. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sturgis, it's the, like, the largest motorcycle rally that happens in South Dakota every year. Um, and this is sort of an example I like to show of like um, how photography takes me to places I never thought I would be. You know, I, without this assignment, I don't think I didn't even know what Sturgis was. Um, but through photography, you know, I got to experience this really cool, awesome event, and uh, and I'm happy with the photos that I had there too. Uh, this is that story in the south of France. Uh, for, this was for Afar magazine, a tra another travel magazine. Um, when people hear that like I'm a travel photographer, you know, they ask all the time, oh, like what's the best place you've ever been sent? Um, here, this was it. <laughs> Although Amman was really good too. But this is a story I shot, um, I guess two years ago. It came out, it was published last year, but it, I shot it at the end of the previous year um, in the Greek Isles, mostly this island called Paros. Um, and what I love shooting about, like shooting travel is, other than the obvious, is um, it really allows you to shoot, or really necessitates you to shoot um, such a range of images. You know, you have to shoot uh, food and landscapes and people and interiors and, you know, everything in between. Um, so I love that not, I love that it's not like pigeonholed to like just shooting this one thing. Like, I'm really grateful and thankful that like I've been able to keep my career kind of open and shooting a ton of things and not only known as, like, oh, she's a food photographer, oh, she's a travel photographer. You know, I'm happy that I get to and get hired to shoot all sorts of things that keeps it interesting. Um, so, but travel shoots are not all fun and games. It's very exhausting. You're up at sunrise, sunset, um, you know, scrambling around, trying to get into places. Um, so I actually broke my toe on this shoot in Greece. And um, the last two days of the shoot, I shot on crutches and kind of like out of the car window. <laughs> but uh, it definitely was a dream assignment, and it landed me with sort of my first national magazine cover. This came out um, in March of last year. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's rewarding for sure. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so that's just like a little bit of a peek into sort of my editorial work and what I've been up to since the first Beetlebung stuff came out. Um, but I'm just going to go back to Beetlebung stuff and tell you a little bit more what happened with that project. Um, so, you know, shooting lots of editorial, traveling around, continuing to shoot with Chris whenever possible. Um, and in that time, I ended up shooting a book, whew, a book um, with another friend who's a chef and a farmer. I brought the book here if anyone wants to see. It's called The Catch. This guy, he's a, his name is Ben Sargent. He's a, he has a show on the Cooking Channel called Hook, Line, and Dinner, Hook, Line, something like that. Um, and I actually knew him also from the vineyard growing up, and he knew I was a photographer and had seen some of my work. Um, 
And so anyone can check this out later. But this um, project came up, and that was kind of like, I got hired to shoot that. We went up a couple times to shoot it, and I wasn't involved in the beginning, and I wasn't involved in the end. I just kind of did my part shooting, and it left it him, and it was his project, um, which is very different. So from what Chris and I did, Chris and I decided we wanted to do a cookbook together with our Beetlebung stuff. Um, you know, he was getting tons of press for it, and uh, you know, he really wanted to do a book. Oh, here are just a couple images from the previous book. So working on this book, The Catch, I had a, we had a book agent who helped us get this book off the ground. I, I mean, I didn't have it. Ben, the, the guy, the chef, had a book agent. Um, <coughs> and um, I saw when Chris and I had this idea of like wanting to put together a book, we reached out to this same book agent who I had gotten along with and sort of pitched him idea of doing a Beetlebung farm book. And we put together, and he was very interested in it, and I uh, thought it would make a great project. <clears throat> so we worked on a proposal. Um, I actually brought um, the proposal here. I'm going to jump out of here for a sec um, and show you, because I didn't really know about pitching books, um, so I thought this would be helpful just to kind of show what goes into a proposal. It's, uh, you know, we spent a lot of work doing it, but um, it obviously paid off. So I'm just going to scroll here quickly and show you. This was um, the actual proposal that we put together. So, you know, a title page, uh, a sampling of sort of images that could potentially be in the book, um, you know, a brief table of contents, sort of overview of the, what we envisioned the book to be, um, you know, about uh, Chris's philosophy in cooking and, you know, our collaborations together up till that point. You know, sprinkling in my images throughout. There's a section about the author, so Chris and his accomplishments. Um, and then a section about me and my photography. This isn't any like big design thing either. We just did this in like Google Docs kind of thing. Um, section about the farm. Uh, sort of a potential like outreach if we were to have a book, people who could um, publicize for us. And then we had a sort of a sample outline of what we envisioned the book to be like. Um, scroll through here. Um, and then uh, a sample chapter. And I think, yeah, a couple sample recipes and menus. Um, so, that, so that was the proposal. Um, and it was, you know, um, they sent it, the agent sent it around to a bunch of potential publishers and it actually went to a bidding war uh, and Little Brown actually ended up being the, um, the publisher uh, who wanted to make a, the book, which we were really happy about. So here we are and we're, you know, going forward knowing we're going to make this book project. So we had obviously a ton of images already with all the lifestyle and farm stuff, but um, Chris really needed to develop the recipes, um, and he worked together with a woman, Kathy, who helped recipe test with him. Um, and so the following summer, instead of just like shooting whatever I felt like, we actually, you know, spent not just the summer, but throughout the year, you know, shooting images to go with the recipes that were going to be in the book. Um, and um, throughout that summer, we also um, just we knew the book was coming out, but it was only going to be down the line. You know, it was actually two years later from when we got the first uh, offer. We did these little journals, which I brought here as well, just to like get um, interest for the book um, with content that we knew wasn't going to make it into the book, but you know, with images and photos and recipes that weren't going to be in the book, but just kind of something that we could like show to people, like look at the stuff we're doing, and the book's coming out in a year. And um, we had a friend who's a letter presser. And helped like she let her press the covers and helped design it. So just like these little little mini books, and we just I think we sold them at the farm stand. This is a different one of just content that wasn't going to be in the book. And then we ha would have little parties for when those were coming out. Um, we called them yeah the summer journals, and just to sort of build up hype. Um, so then flash forward to this summer. So basically seven years later from when I first started shooting with Chris. Uh, we published this cookbook, which I also have here. If anyone wants to see it after, this is the book. Um, I just have some samples here, but um, 
And so it was you know, a very long process, but I was sort of involved throughout from the beginning concept to pitching it. Um, we didn't have a designer for a while, so we all kind of, me and Chris and Kathy, designed it together at one point. Then we finally got a designer. This is sort of a sampling of some of the images that are in the book. And uh, the book was going to launch in June of last summer. And so I decided I wanted to have an exhibit of, the image, of some of the images from the book to uh, ha be in conjunction with the launch of the book. And there's a gallery space uh, on the island um, at the library, which is across the street from the farm. Uh, this a whole room um, that they have exhibits. So it would just be a perfect opportunity to you know, get hype for the book and have the images. Um, so this is uh, I did. Uh, this is a postcard that I did, which I like sent out and mailed to people to getting them excited about the exhibit and invite them to the exhibit with details about the show. And then on the right hand side was I just put together as like an e blast to send out to people. And obviously, um, this uh, wasn't uh, the show was on Martha's Vineyard. I know not everyone's going to come out to go there, but I sent this to all my photo contacts to photo editors and art buyers and you know anyone just to be like to you know get like people talking and thinking about it oh she's having a show and um, just good like marketing um, so I sent that out this is uh, some images from the actual ex uh, from the exhibit and I you know ended up selling some prints here which was great um, this is me and Chris at the opening um, so the book came out and has done like really well. Um, this is a good mention we got in T Magazine, um, got positive reviews in Vanity Fair and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and bon Appetit just named it one of the top cookbooks of 2015 this past December. Um, and I even got some press for it as well. This was, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, PDN is like a photo industry magazine. Um, they contacted me. Um, they probably saw about the project somewhere. Um, because I do a lot of marketing. <laughs> and um, they, they basically wrote up what I just told you, sort of the arc of the project and how it started off with Chris and you know, we got to this cookbook. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and so I'm still shooting with Chris, you know, just because the cookbook is out, I don't think that uh, like our co collaborations are gonna stop. Um, I have a vision sort of to do, uh, the cookbook was obviously a cookbook with his recipes and stuff. Um, so I have a vision of doing a sort of photo book that's something like 10 years at Beetlebung or something like that down the line. But I still want to, you know, his career, who knows where he's going to be next. Um, so still hang out, you know, shoot him and see what happens. Um, so that's sort of the arc of one project and how it opened me up in, into other works. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about a couple other projects and what those have led to. Um, I, so I read a quote on Facebook the other day that said, uh, don't trust anyone who doesn't do per personal work. And so I support that 100%. I think it's so important. Um, you'll hear that again and again. So here's a couple projects. This is a, um, a project that I did called Bloggers. Um, and for me, it was uh, the first time that I had, like, um, this was, I started in 2010, um, where I had a body of work that was um, a cohesive, sort of project, not just like one image here, one image there, but like a, a body of work that was, um, had like a purpose and, you know, had a story to tell through the images. So I shot bloggers being lit by their computer screens. Um, I shot about 50 people um, for it. And it was, as I said, the first project of mine that got any real attention. Um, I had just posted it on my blog and uh, I hadn't like written a statement about it or sort of packaged it up or anything, but um, Someone at Wired Magazine saw it and ended up blogging about it on Wired.com. And from there, the project kind of went viral online, um, which was awesome and cool, but I hadn't really um, hadn't finished shooting it. I didn't know exactly like a project statement about it yet, and it kind of got away from me. Um, and I exhibited it um, throughout the world, which is really cool. Um, and I, I'm not going to talk too much more about the series, but it just sort of taught me what it means to create a body of work and uh, how to talk about it and put it out into the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about another project called The Kids. So the way that the Bloggers and Beetle Run project was a personal reflection, sort of me documenting the world I was living in. Um, this project, The Kids, is a much more personal project. 
um, and has a much more impactful message uh, and has led to a bunch of other things as well. Um, so Beetlebung was work that started off totally personal, me shooting what I wanted to for fun and ended up being something. With this project, the kids, again, very personal, but I knew going in and starting the work that I wanted it to be published somewhere. So unlike the bloggers that sort of got out of my hand before I had any control of it, with this project, the kids, which I'll tell you about in a sec, I, want, I knew I wanted to sort of package it up and have it ready and sort of make its debut published in print somewhere. That was sort of my goal with this project. Um, so the, OK, the kids project. Um, so my mom came out when I was in high school. Um, it was a very difficult time for me, and I didn't really speak to her for a year. And I never talked to anyone about it. Um, it wasn't until I was uh, 29 that I was able to say the words out loud, my mom is gay. Um, I had never met anyone else who had a gay parent. And <coughs> so this project is about um, children. And I made it be adult children, so people had to be in college or older so that they had sort of like the reflection back to be able to talk about it, um, who were raised by a gay parent or had a gay parent come out. And for me, this project was a way that I could you know, it was very personal, and for me it was almost not selfish, but I used the project as my own therapy to meet other people who had shared my same experiences who I had never met before going into the project. Um, and I had a idea for a project, but um, I didn't know anyone, and I didn't even know where to start looking to, to shoot this project, even though I knew what I wanted it to be. Um, so I mentioned it to my sister, who like knew of some organization, and she contacted me with this woman, Danielle. So this is how it started. Um, Danielle uh, was raised by six parents, so she had two dads, no, four dads, and two moms, growing up like all six, um, and was running uh, the New York chapter of an organization called Collage, which is the only national nonprofit that um, supports uh, kids who have a gay parent. So I, through her, I started meeting other people um, and through the organization. And the project sort of um, you know, got legs from there. Um, so this is Jamie. Um, she was raised outside Chicago by her mom and her various partners. I'll just show you a couple of the other subjects. Uh, this is Elizabeth. She was raised in Boston by her mom and her dad. And her dad came out when she was in college. So with each portrait, I also interviewed each subject, uh, sorry, because um, uh, I knew I wanted to sort of share their story. And I had the idea of having a sort of audio component with a project where you would be able to listen to the, the kids talking about their families. Um, so um, e each, each portrait has sort of a quote and an audio clip. So I'll just read you that this is the quote that I pulled out for Elizabeth. Um, it says, uh, he said, it's time for me to confront my identity. And I asked, are you gay? And he says, well, I haven't had any experience to be sure. And I think the next words out of my mouth were, dad, I'm pretty sure you're gay. <laughs> um, this is Aaron. He was raised in Berkeley, California by his two moms. And then um, his moms actually split up. And one of his moms remarried a guy, so was then married, uh, raised with his two moms and stepfather. Um, this is Hope, um, and she was raised in New York City by her two dads. And of the 40 people that I've shot, she was actually the only person that that was a scenario, that she had two dads. Um, this is Moshe was raised upstate in New York by his two moms. This is Lauren raised in Kansas City, Missouri uh, by her mom and her dad, who came out when she was seven. Um, this is uh, Mark, who's raised in Pennsylvania by his mom and dad, who came out when he was in college. Um, this is Zach, who's raised in Iowa by his two moms. And um, he actually became sort of YouTube famous. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, in 2011, he was the guy who spoke. It was like a YouTube clip that went viral, um, the kid who spoke out in front of the Iowa State Senate in the support of uh, gay marriage. So this was him. Um, Diana, she's raised in upstate New York by her mom and her dad, who came out when she was in college. Uh, and this is my sister, Paloma. She was raised in Boston, and our mom came out when she was 13. I have not, I've yet to interview her. Um, it's definitely a hard conversation to have, and I know we'll have it someday, but haven't been able to do it yet. Um, and uh, I know I still want to shoot myself for the project. Um, which I need to do um, at some point. 
Um, so so that I started shooting this four years ago, and as I said, from based on the blogger, blogger's experience, I knew that this project, I wanted to sort of package it up before I got it out there. I didn't want to just post like the images to my site or blog, um, but I had you know proper debut. In my mind, I had uh, I w a dream was that I wanted it to be published in the New York Times Magazine, which for me as an editorial photographer, I think is sort of the high bar of editorial photography. Um, I haven't shot for them yet. Someday I hope to. Um, it's just beautiful photography. I read the magazine cover to cover uh, every week. Um, so that was my dream. And I reached out to them. I had been in touch with a couple of the photo editors there. Um, I reached out to them, but sort of, again, a little too early before the project was wrapped, um, or before I had sort of written about it. And uh, they passed on it. And that was definitely like a setback for me, because my dream was crushed. Um, but you know, I you know, kept on going. And I was you know, shooting editorial stuff. And this was a project that was always happening in the background when I had time, or when I was traveling somewhere, I was able to reach out to someone. Um, so I didn't have any timeline, but this past spring when I found out that the Supreme Court was going to be deciding uh, the case on marriage equality, I was like, okay, now's the time. I need to get my project out. Like, this is so perfect, timely, like, let's get it in gear. So uh, I had shot enough people that I knew I could narrow it down into an edit, um, and I knew that I wanted to in incorporate the audio clips. Um, so I had edited the photos. Um, the audio, I'm not technical at all. I just... Uh, used my iPhone to record people. A lot of the interviews, you know, you'll hear like cars in the background and stuff like that. But, um, and I, I didn't really know about editing audio at all. I literally just used GarageBand. And, uh, you know, the interviews were from half hour, sometimes to an hour and a half. And I, you know, I wanted to get down to a manageable web size clip, so two to three minutes. Um, so that took forever to edit all the audio. Um, and I didn't think it was something that I could really outsource to someone else because it was so personal. Not only the subjects sharing the stories, but you know, in the conversations, I would share so much of me, and sort of I knew the kind of clips I was going for. So that took forever, um, but I did it. And then I, you know, needed to build a website. I knew I wanted a website that uh, was its own website that wasn't going to be just a page on my my own website. Um, so luckily, I'm married to a web design guy, so he helped me with that. But it's very frustrating not to be able to, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're your own project. Like I wanted to be able to like build a website and do this, and like having to rely on someone else is very frustrating. Like to not be able to just do it on my own. But I was lucky, so you know, he he did it for me. <laughs> uh, so this is a screenshot of the website. Um, I think I've actually pulled it up here as well. So that this is um, what the site actually looks like um, when you go to it, and uh, so every person has a, you know their name, a caption, a quote, and then you can click and listen to their audio. Um, so I, this isn't I didn't put everyone here, but I think on the site there's about maybe 25 from the, from the sh from what I shot. So um, so that's the project website. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I had, so once the website was built, you know, and I, I needed to, you know, start sharing it to people and pitching it around. And um, every time I would go to a meeting with like a photo editor, you know, I'd bring my regular portfolio, but say, oh, can I show you this personal project I've been working on? Not necessarily uh, if it was like. I wanted to pitch to that publication, but just to show that I had been working on my own project. And then I would ask them, oh, like for input, or you know, do you have any ideas of where I could pitch this to, or who might be interested in running this story? Um, so I was in talks with multiple magazines, um, and, and one of them actually led me for about two months. Like we're like, yeah, we're interested, we're interested. Like send us this, send us that. Can you do this? And I was doing it all, and then they're like, yeah, we're not going to run it. Um, so that was frustrating. Uh, but I ended up, I think everything always works out for a reason. And so I had been in touch with the photo editor of the New York Times Sunday Review years back with a different project that I had pitched that they were not interested in. But I thought that maybe because of the timing of this project and having it sort of definitely be ready at this point to get out there, um, that, that this might work. So I reached out uh, to that photo editor. Um, and this time, the timing was right. And uh, they decided to um, run it in the Sunday Review. I think it's important for for these for this project for the stories to um, to be able to hear from the subjects from their own voices because it is something that's so personal. 
Um, that's why I incorporated the audio. So this is um, the New York Times, uh, what ran in the Sunday Review. And then they also did an online feature that had about 14 of the subject's images. Um, and for it was you know the best case scenario in terms of um, reach, the New York Times is probably the widest audience that I would ever have for the project. And it made me um, have to write about, they wanted me to write my own personal story, which I hadn't done yet. So it was like sort of forced me to do that. Um, it was very hard for me to write and scary um, to put it out there, but um, I'm so glad I did. And I had some great editors, and you know I'm proud that it, that it's out there now. And so I went from basically not being able to say any words out loud to sort of screaming my whole story to the world. Um, so yeah, that was that was a good step. <laughs> um, so when the New York Times thing ran, that sort of Again, having published work leads to other published work. So people would see this. And then I started getting contacted by other publications worldwide. And the following month, the Observer magazine, which is it's kind of the equivalent of the New York Times Sunday magazine, but for the London's The Guardian, they ended up publishing it as a cover story. So it wasn't the New York Times magazine, but still, you know, I'll take it. This was such a great outlet. Um, and it was definitely a big deal for me. Um, this, it, I, I had an interviewer come uh, to my home for this and at, talk to me about the project. And I had no idea, sort of, after you know two hours chatting with him, uh, what he was going to do the article about. It was about the photos, about the project, about me. And it ended up being a lot about me and my story, which I wasn't necessarily ready for. This is, uh, that was the cover, and this is what um, ran in the, in the magazine. Um, so when, when I first saw it, when it came out, I actually cried for like three hours. And uh, um, I was just nervous about some things that I had said. And, uh, but I'm ultimately I'm glad it's out there. Uh, my mom and her partner were like so like thrilled. And they were posting on their Facebook. So I was like, OK, if they're into it, like I can share it too. And, um, and it, you know, getting, I'm glad I could get my story out there. Hopefully it would spark others to share as well. Um, and so from, from that, then started getting picked up in other sort of online sites and publications. So Out Magazine, Refinery29, um, Columbia Journalism Review, uh, Lens Scratch, which is another great um, photo blog, which you guys should read if you don't. Um, so uh, it, was get, it was getting, you know, making the rounds online on sites and blogs. And then I also started getting emails from other subject, from other kids around the world. Um, I just put one of them up here. Um, I'm not going to read it, but you know, I, I started getting contact from other kids just saying, you know, thank you so much for sharing your project. Like, you know, I've never told this to anyone, but my mom is gay too. And you know, um, that's sort of the reason why I did this project, uh, knowing that there are, there are others out there who might feel a little less alone having seen these images, um, and you know, getting the stories out of people who we haven't really heard from stories from 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 kids yet. Um, that's sort of where the project has ended so far. I'm not done with the project. I'm still shooting it. Since then, I've gotten contacted with kids around the world, I have sort of a, a Google spreadsheet of uh, cities that like, any time I travel somewhere, I can reach out to and have a subject to shoot. So I think it would be sort of a disservice to just stop it at this point. Like, just because you know it, it came out in the Times doesn't mean that there's more stories that could be told. And um, I got a couple book offers. and. I'm potentially doing a, an exhibit in 2017 um, for it. And so with this project, it's just sort of at the beginning of what's happening next. So um, I don't really know what's going to happen. But uh, one thing happened was this is what ran um, in Out Magazine. They just did a sort of profile on the project. And then this December, I got contacted uh, for Out Mag from Out Magazine to shoot an assignment for them. And um, they're not a magazine that I had really targeted prior. Um, but because they had seen the, the kids' project and uh, they had this uh, assignment that was um, for their love issue, it actually came out, it's out in this month's issue right now. It was six couples um, that I shot. Sort of they wanted the same style that I had shot the kids' people, so um, not overly lit and people in their homes. And um, so, so, so far it's led to this assignment here. And uh, as, again, as again, I said, it's just the beginning, so I'm hoping that it will lead to other things too. Um, this is some of the images from that love issue. I actually haven't even seen it in, in print yet. I have to go to the office tomorrow to get it. Um, and then kind of randomly, um, 
published work leading to more published work. So it came out in the New York Times Magazine, My Kids Project, which you saw what it was. And after that, I got contacted by a photo editor at um, the German magazine Capital and said, hey, we saw your kids project. We have this assignment. We'd love for you to shoot for us. I'm like, yes, great, let's do it. And it was to shoot Ronnie of Ronnie Brook Farms in upstate New York and his like milk factory. So like that's not, I would never pitch to that client or anything, but they found me through the, the Times piece and, and led to this assignment work. So that's just kind of random. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit now just sort of practical terms of uh, so you have a body of work that you've shot, a personal project, okay, now what, like what do you do with it? The main thing is to get it out there because as I said, once it's out there, people see it, then you start getting hired to shoot work that's uh, in that style, especially if it's like a personal passion project, you, people, editors, and so, they can tell it's like something you're excited about and into, and so when the right time comes up for an assignment that is in line with what you're already passionate about, they'll be like, oh, like that person should shoot it because they saw the work prior. Um, so how to get your work out there. Um, there's lots of things to do. Um, the main thing, one of the biggest things is doing a promo. Um, so a promo is anything from uh, a postcard to a booklet um, to a poster, a multi-panel thing. There's all sorts of ways to do that. Um, and uh, there's, there's cost-efficient ways to do it really cheaply. Just like a four by six postcard mailing out is a great way to get someone's attention. And of course, there's more complex, like custom design things that you can do that cost more. Um, I brought some promos here. These are just, uh, here's a sampling of some postcards that I've made. You can come take a look at these. This is, I'll talk in a little bit, but this is like a booklet that I did for a rodeo project. Um, this is a poster that I did just to get some more editorial work with like food and farming stuff. So, you know, you open it like this and um, it's a poster that people can put on their walls. Um, I even like, I just found this when I was on the subway here in my like bag. I forgot I had made, this was like a little book I made of like the bloggers project that I would like leave behind with people. and. Uh, I love doing these like sticker books, like just and I like will seal envelopes with like stickers of things. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. Um, if you're like you know wanted to know or like check out uh, like other promos, um, there's the website a photo editor. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but it's a great website. The um, Rob Haggart runs it. He used to be a photo editor in New York. He moved out to Colorado and has this site that's just a really good resource um, for photographers. Has sort of like you know, everything from like billing questions to, um, uh, you know, marketing tips. And what he started to do maybe a year a year or two ago was on his Instagram, which is just um, a photo editor. Um, his Instagram feed is now basically people just mail him promos and he'll Instagram them. And uh, it's a great way to see uh, what what photographers are doing out there. Like, I love following it because I'm like, oh, that person just did this promo. Or like, oh, look what she's shooting. And, and you get to, he actually photographs everything from like the envelope, the way it was sent, which is like, you know, the promo is cool, but also you got to think about the packaging and um, the mailing. So he'll photograph the outside envelope. And then like, you know, if it's like five things, he'll photograph each five things and post it, you know, front and back. And it's a great just way to see, get ideas of different promo things and find out what kind of things you like and what you don't like. Um, PDN also has a Tumblr that's called Promos We Kept. Uh, again, you know, they get sent tons of stuff in their mailroom and so they'll sift through and just take a picture of the ones they like. And uh, that's a great um, blog to follow. And then I don't use Pinterest that much, but um, I, I, I used it when I was researching for one of my promos. And, as you can see at the top here, all I did was type in um, photography and promos, and there's so many stuff, stuff that pop up. So you could like do your own Pinterest board of like you know anytime you see something you like, just save it. Um, so you can have like when you're time to make a promo, you know like what kind of direction that you want to do. And uh, once you have an idea of the kind of promo you want to make, then you have to get it printed. Um, there's so many options for that as well. So I tend to, whenever there's a promo that I, that I, from a photographer that I find that I like, I will literally like email the photographer. If it's a friend, ask the friend like, you know, where did you get these printed? Like, how was your experience with them? Do you like the printing? Um, I definitely get emails from from photographers asking me where I've printed things. Um, 
just if you, uh, I have a, just a couple examples for for like cheap postcards. I like using next day flyers or overnight prints. Um, for the that that poster thing, I used a, a company called Linko Printing, which a friend of mine had done a poster with that I really liked. Um, so I asked him, and that's actually here in Long Island City. Um, for the the Rodeo Queens book, it was a company called Smart Press. So depending on the project, um, you can like research around different different places to get things printed. Um, so the the poster which I showed you, um, I actually made that not just a poster but a sort of a bigger package. I had these um, had the idea to tie in. So it was kind of food and farming and travel. So I had got bought seeds and had custom rubber stamps made and had these seed packets that I sent everything in a clear envelope. So the envelope um, you saw, the, like this was an outer image, and I put a sticker over it with the address. And inside there was seed packets. And then I also had a postcard and a handwritten note on the postcard to whoever was sending it to, you know, sharing my promo with them. And I actually, I, I send out promos all the time. Um, and you really, there's no way to, it's very hard to tell if they were successful or not. Like, rarely will you get an email being like, oh, I got your promo, we love it, come work for us. It doesn't happen like that. What happens is people just like, you send them promos and they're like just reminding them who you are, what you're shooting. So when the time comes, uh, something will pop up. So um, I sent this out two years ago. And this summer, uh, in August, I got an assignment because the person reached out to me and was like, oh, I loved your, your seed promo. I have it on, like, on my mantle. When I go give talks, I like, mention it. And like, a project came up that she knew my work and thought it would be appropriate for. And so I got an assignment. But that was two years later. So, um, so keep at it. <laughs> um, besides the physical things, you know, e-blast is a great way um, to reach out. So that's you know, newsletters or just like emailing photo editors and art buyers. Um, I send out a newsletter not on any sort of regular schedule, but just when I when I have news. Um, I use Mailchimp. Uh, this is an example of a promo. Sorry, a newsletter. I usually will like start it off like hello intro, what I've been up to. Here's some published work. Um, this is kind of weird. It's so it, the layout, but it's just like a scrolling thing when you actually see it in the email. Oh, actually, I might have one here. Um, yeah, so this was like a recent one. So this is like what it, when you get in the inbox, it's like this. So it's like you know some some recent work that got published. I like to usually include um, a, a personal project or if like you know there's press like this was the PDN thing. Um, or I used to I like to end it with a personal image. So like this one, the last image I usually leave is just something that I shot myself for fun. Um, but then when there's projects, I do a newsletter that's just for that project. So this was the newsletter that I sent out when the book came out in June. Uh, which was, you know, book, a little intro about it, some images that are in it, and the invite to the exhibit. So I sent that out to everyone. And uh, it, June was crazy because the beautiful one project I'd been working on for seven years, and the book and the exhibit came out in June. And the kids project, which I'd been working on five years, uh, came out in the New York Times in June. So it was like a crazy time. And like, I wouldn't normally send like two promos in a month, two newsletters in a month, but you know, I ended up sending this one here as well. Um, which was like a blurb about the kids project, mentioning that it had been out in the New York Times, and then I included, uh, you know, the cover of the Observer, <clears throat> and I send these out to you know everyone. I have like my mailing list, which is uh, friends, family, people I've met, other photographers, photo editors. Um, but just like a like an insider tip is that I use Mailchimp for my newsletters, but when you use something like Mailchimp or Constant Contact or any one of those, um, they send out the emails for you. So that um, when when the recipients receive it, if people have one of those inboxes that gets sorted by you know important emails, promotions, updates, anything from a Mailchimp kind of place will go to their updates box of their inbox. So what I like to do, um, I'll separate out um, who I'm sending it to depending on the project. So for example, for this kids one, I send it to my whole mailing list, but I'll take out uh, the photo editors who assign portrait work because this is a portrait project. And for those ones, I'll individually email them from my email to their, to their individual email with the exact content. I'll just copy and paste what's ever in the newsletter. But um, I'll send it like individually rather than through MailChimp so that I know it has a better chance of them actually reading it and not going to like their spam folder, their like promo folder that they only look at like once a month. It's just like a little tip. Um, 
And then being social, I talk about this all the time. It's like the number one advice I tell to people uh, when they ask me you know, advice on how to get started. Be social, um, online, offline, everywhere. That's how you know, I got my first assisting jobs was you know, meeting other photographers and them referring me. Um, when you have a face-to-face -face meeting with an editor, that makes it so much more uh, chance that you'll actually get hired versus just like sending out emails you know, with them not knowing who you are. Um, networking, that's like you know, coming to an event like this, um, going to photo openings, um, attending workshops, festivals, photo conferences, the whole shebang. Um, and I just have this one example here. I, this, this is a very rare example, but I went to um, a photo networking social happy hour thing and ended up meeting at that um, a photo editor from Travel and Leisure, which was a publication that I never had uh, been able to get a meeting with. I've been trying for years to meet with them, never able, never responded to my emails, even though I keep sending them stuff. And um, I met the photo editor there. Uh, it was like a Tuesday night. The following week, I was on a plane to Bermuda shooting for them for the first time. Um, so that is a very rare example of of, it doesn't work that fast. Usually you have to build a relationship, but I just thought I'd include that. Um, social media, so you know that's obviously Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr. Uh, I do all of that. Um, people who follow me probably get sick of all the stuff I do, but like that's you know that's how I get work. Is I know that there's a lot of photo editors that follow me on Instagram, and it's a great way for them to like. I I tend to almost always just posts like sort of iPhone photos of where I am. So it's a way for them to know like, oh, like she's traveling like in Oman right now. Let me, you know, she might, you know, for them to actually know physically where you are by following me on Instagram. Um, how's time? Okay, we're good for time. Okay, I, I, there's one more project I'll talk about um, which ties into the social media, um, which is a project that I did about rodeo queens. Um, so this project was actually, it's kind of an instance where um, a, it was originally an assignment, but it turned into a personal project, and then stuff came out of it after that. So this was for Cosmo. Um, they assigned me to follow around Miss Rodeo Oregon. Um, for uh, It was actually like a long-form assignment. Um, so it was three different week-long tri trips out west um, to follow. This is Nicole Schrock, who was Miss Rodeo Oregon, and her quest to compete for the Miss Rodeo America Championship, which happened in Vegas at the end of the year. I definitely knew nothing about Rodeo Queens or that they even existed, like going into this project. And after like three weeks of like following them, I like knew like way too much. Um, and uh, but but it, it was just like uh, it was an amazing assignment, probably like the favorite, my favorite assignment I've, I've I've ever had. And the reason why I got this shoot was from one newsletter that I had sent out. Um, prior like that year that had work about a small town folk festival um, in Pennsylvania. And so it was work that I did for Martha Stewart about this folk festival. And the photo editor saw that on the day that she needed to assign a photographer for this assignment where the first part of the trip was going to be at her small town rodeo in Oregon hanging out and shooting. So, so that's why I got this assignment. So that's just that was an example of sort of how the newsletter actually worked to get me a job, which is again rare to actually be able to see the connection from sending out the newsletter to getting the assignment. Um, so I'll just show you some images from this project. Um, I, w that I followed Nicole mostly, but then met a bunch of the other rodeo queens, and uh, there was a writer who was with me um, for all of the trips, and uh, we got along really well. Um, so the first trip was with Nicole and her family in her small town in Oregon. The second trip was Nicole had invited um, five of her Rodeo Queen friends to Oregon. And for a week, we like sort of did a tour. I basically went on vacation with Rodeo Queens for a week around Oregon. Um, and uh, it was quite a scene, sort of when you're with like six rodeo queens, like crossing the street in like their full-on outfits. <laughs> so like we we went to the beach, we visited a cheese factory, we went to a lumber yard. It was definitely a memorable experience. <laughs> Um, this is, um, uh, yeah, this is still part of the second trip. We w ended up in Pendleton, which is the biggest rodeo, uh, 
fir the first or second largest rodeo that happens in the country, but it's definitely the most historic rodeo. So um, I actually had to, all journalists at this at the Pendleton have to dress in rodeo wear. So I got a budget from Cosmo, because I didn't have anything, I got a budget from Cosmo to go out and buy cowboy boots and like a cowboy shirt which is awesome. And uh, so it's like a grass rodeo and like there's no advertisements in the stadium. Um, and there was lots of rodeo queens there. <laughs> I don't love this image photographically, but I sort of, I leave it in the series because I think it, we really get a sense of uh, what the queening world is like. And like they, they all use queening as a verb. <laughs> this is one of my favorite images from the series. And she, uh, this is Miss Rodia Washington, and she was such a drama queen. <laughs> uh, so the third trip was in Las Vegas, um, and this is uh, at the uh, the rodeo, the Miss Rodeo America Championships, which actually coincides with Rodeo Week. Um, so Rodeo Week in Vegas is crazy. There's just cowboys everywhere. Um, it's quite an experience. I mean, Vegas is crazy in itself, but Rodeo Week in Vegas, crazy. Um, so there's lots of like, the, the, the competition is very much a mix of um, sort of part Miss America and part like rodeo. So this is like, they did have like a current events public speaking part of it. And there's a fashion show. This is part of the fashion show. Um, but then there's also like, they have to like get on a horse and like do different like courses in the rodeo. And they have to like take a written test about the history of rodeo. Um, this is Shanae Shiner, that's totally her name, and her boyfriend's name is Stetson Vest. Um, and they're like, they're like rodeo queen royalty. She was the reigning champion of 2013 and was sort of there to pass the torch. Um, and so I had been following around Nicole the whole time and she ended up coming in third place. Um, this is who actually won was Miss Rodeo Mississippi, which is so weird because throughout the week in Vegas, like everyone was talking about like who's buzzing, who's going to win. And so I was kind of shooting more the people that everyone was talking about. And this girl, I did not shoot at all. I had like no pictures of her because she was like, no one was talking about her and she ended up winning. Um, this is right after she was crowned. This is also a favorite image from the work. And this image was actually just accepted um, last year into uh, the American Photography Annual, which I was very happy about because I'd submitted to that. It's a big competition, um, and I, I submitted it to the past five years, six years, never gotten in. So this was the first time with this image that I got into that book. Um, and this is what ended up running in Cosmo. It was six pages. They actually ended up cutting out most of what... Uh, the writer Kelly had written and made it sort of like a photo essay. And uh, it was very much sort of Cosmo edit. It's not sort of the images that I would have chosen. Obviously, like they have a certain audience and need to show the images in a certain way. Um, but I had so much material. And I'm not at all disappointed that this was what, what, what ran, but uh, I just had so much material and was like, it's a shame that like that's it. Um, and Kelly was like totally bummed that all of her sort of hard work and reporting like was not public at all for people to see. And so me and her together decided we wanted to like kind of elevate and pr do a project with all of my images and uh, her writing um, the way that we wanted, that we, that we envisioned to get the work out there. Um, so we decided to put together this book, which I showed you here. We did a couple things. One of the things was put together this book. So it was sort of like my version of like the edit of the photos that I wanted to tell, um, along with like um, it has some of uh, her writing and some of the captions and quotes of the girls. Um, and this was like a purpose for like a promo book for me, sort of. So I sent that out to about 150 uh, photo editors and art buyers. Um, there's more layouts from the book. Um, and um, I ended up getting some press. So PDN wrote about it in a, you know, a blog post about sort of promos that they love. And um, a photo editor uh, did a blog post about, uh, about this promo piece. So that got me some more press. And then the second thing that we did was um, going back to uh, social media stuff. I don't, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Medium. I didn't really know that much about it, but um, we ended up publishing the story uh, uh, with Kelly's full text the way that she wanted and, and my images um, on Medium. And um, it was really cool like just to see like a platform that I wasn't really familiar with. 
And we were able to, it got picked up by Matter, which is sort of Medium's internal, like, check out these posts. Um, so uh, it was able to be reach this like way wider audience than originally with the Cosmo audience. And we got to share the story that we wanted to tell. Um, and it also led, someone saw it, and it led to the uh, images being published in American Cowboy magazine, which is obviously an appropriate fit. So um, this is what ran in American Cowboy. And it's an edit that I'm really happy with. And again, there's very uh, focus on like just the photos and a clean layout. Um, so that's just sort of how we took the assignment work into a personal project. Um, and then again, totally random, but um, someone, a photo editor um, in Canada saw it. She runs um, the Canadian, uh, the, uh, for, she works for the Globe and Mail. And she saw the Rodeo Queens project and was like, oh, reach out to me. We love the Rodeo Queens, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have an assignment for you. And it was to shoot this business professor at Yale. So didn't totally translate, but I got a cover um, out of it, um, which was exciting for me. Um, and just someone else seeing my work. And um, so it's, uh, sometimes it's random. But again, I guess the, the end of the story is that like once you have work out there, it leads to more work. Um, and, and most of this all started from personal work, which, would, which led to other stuff. Um, so I guess just in wrapping up, like through the power of photography, um, especially with my kids' project, I know that like, I'm making a difference and contributing to a conversation uh, and making an impact. And I love what I do. I'm so grateful. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.